Uh, good morning from Denver. <laughs> uh, I know it's nighttime there and raining, um, but it's beautiful and sunny here in Denver. Thank you so much for inviting me to 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 give a talk. And I I wish I could have come two years ago, and I wish I could be there now in person. Um, but I just want to thank uh, Maria and Dominic and all the organizers for uh, putting this together. I'm sure that it's not been easy to organize uh, a panel or a conference under the conditions of, you know, COVID and the sort of hybrid online in-person structure. So I, I think everybody uh, really appreciates the work that you're doing. So thank you. Um, so the, my talk uh, today is called uh, Moving Borders. And uh, I just want to say just a couple words about, um, I don't know, just the background of like my motivation, how I got into this, um, just to give you some context. Um, so in uh, 2009 and 2010, uh, I did a Fulbright scholarship research um, uh, project where I lived in Montreal and Toronto for a year. Uh, and I worked with this organization. You all know it, Kind Mensch is illegal. Uh, no one is illegal. Uh, in Canada, we don't uh, we don't have that group in the United States, but um, in Canada, there's a very active uh, core of of people of migrant justice workers uh, doing that work. And so I worked uh, for a year. Well, I just got a year off of of go of of graduate school and teaching and any responsibilities, and just got to be paid very poorly, but still paid to just do full time activist work with this organization. Um, I spent most of the time in Toronto on a campaign called the Solidarity City. Um, I won't go into all the details, but the basic idea was to try to transform the city of Toronto into a place where uh, everyone had access to all services, um, at, regardless of their status, to, because the demand was for the abolition of status and uh, altogether, or the un or the universality of status, um, which almost amounts to the same thing, uh, that everybody in the city would be treated equally, regardless of their status. And so we worked with a lot of uh, uh, community organizations, uh, women's shelters, food banks, schools, to try to make sure that uh, there was a kind of solidarity between people so that nobody would be reporting one another. In any case, it was an incredible experience, and it really informed a lot of my research, changed a lot of the way that I thought about uh migration and borders uh doing this work um i was also working on a phd in philosophy um and at the time i was reading you know in the evenings reading that literature and political theory and really feeling a huge disjunct between what political philosophers were talking about and what i was doing uh day to day and working with uh immigrants in toronto uh and the the, the one of the big disjuncts there was i mean if you look at some of the go-to big theories and political philosophy like John Rawls, I mean, he has nothing to say about uh, borders and migration at all. It's just not part of his political theory. I found that political theorists didn't have a whole lot to say. Uh, I mean, this has all changed, obviously, since even just since 2010. But uh, at the time, 2010, there was very little. So I was more interested in trying to, you know, read Balabar, Ranciere, and Agamben, and think about, uh, and Hannah Arendt, and thinking about how to do more with their work. There's lots of great stuff in there, but it's not as uh, as contemporary or robust as, as I was hoping. In any case, it very much liberal political theory, citizenship studies, those areas tended to treat migration and borders as kind of, you know, exceptions or things that happened under the conditions of already existing societies, and that these were kind of minor things that that could be resolved or at least you know attenuated in some in some ways um but i wanted to do what what came out of that was i really wanted to think about the primacy of migration as a starting point for political theory not as some subset or some other thing but as a starting point and the same with borders to think about borders not just as something that states make but that borders make those states and so it's a it's a it's a longer historical argument that i've tried to trace out in the books that migration, the movement of people, and the creation of borders precedes the states. Before there are any states, before there are societies, there are these practices of moving in certain patterns and of producing borders that shape. And over time, states become these kind of metastable states where they're supported by all these uh, smaller uh, border making practices that have to be constantly reproduced and so on. Um, okay, so that's the background of where I'm coming from. Uh, and ever since then, since 2010, I've 
uh, yeah, just been researching and writing and 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 trying to work out uh, a history and a theory of of the primacy of borders and migrants. Um, so I'm just going to read a little bit um, from an introduction, and then I'll just kind of pause along the way and uh, uh, just give some examples and say a little bit more. But I'm just going to read this introduction. So I think that the 21st century will be the century of the migrant. At the turn of the 21st century, there are, uh, were more than uh, more migrants than ever before in recorded history. Today, there are over 1 billion migrants. So that includes international and internal migration. Migration has risen nearly 50% since the turn of the 21st century and more than 56,000 migrants, and that number is larger now, uh, sit, have died or gone missing worldwide over the last four years. So that's just four years and that number is increasing all the time. More than ever, it's becoming necessary for people to migrate due to environmental, economic and political instability. In particular, climate change may even double international migration over the next 40 years. What is more, the percentage of total migrants who are non-status or undocumented is also increasing, thus posing a serious challenge to democracy and political representation. Any premise of liberal political theory is increasingly falling apart. Um, it's hard to maintain any sense of equality when you know almost a third of the population in the United States, for example, uh, it doesn't have full status, doesn't even have the capacity to uh, vote. Um, they have some kind of status, but not uh, voting or full political status. So what in what sense is there any kind of universality or equality under those conditions? So in order to manage and control this rising global mobility, the world is also becoming ever more bordered. In just the past 20 years, but particularly since the terrorist attacks of September 11th on the United States and more recently the war in Syria, hundreds of new borders have emerged around the world. Miles of new razor wire fences and concrete security walls, offshore detention centers, biometric passport databases, and security checkpoints in schools, airports, uh, and along various roadways across the world. And now with COVID-19, those we have a whole new range of borders and an intensification and transformation of those borders. All make manifest what has always been the true strategy of global capitalism and colonialism, to steal the world's wealth and lock out the poor. This is one of the things that I think borders do is they participate, they're part of a larger global system uh, that, that over that sort of relies on a history of colonialism and then locks out that poor, not locks out in any absolute sense, but criminalizes essentially. Um, and uh, Bruno Latour has, has, has this nice little quote where he says, Europe has invaded all peoples, all peoples are coming to Europe in their turn. So 30, 30 years ago, to the fall of the Berlin Wall, there were only 15 border walls around the world, which at the time I think seemed like a lot. Um, now there are 70 walls. It's not surprising that over the past two decades, we've also seen the rise of an increasingly powerful global climate security market designed to profit from and help sustain these crises. So there's a lot of money to be made. I mean, hundreds of billions of dollars now. This is one of the fastest growing markets is to invest in securitization through borders. So this, so the rise of all these walls is extremely expensive. These are massively intensive, uh, capital intensive projects and people are making tons of money. I mean, a very dramatic case, of course, is the US-Mexico border, which is just this endless sinkhole uh, where taxpayer money goes to private companies to build these gigantic failures of walls. Um, the construction of walls and fences to block rising sea levels is another area where the same border technologies and architectures are being used to sort of combat climate change and rising sea levels um, are, and, and also are related to blocking incoming people, um, has become one of the world's fastest growing industries alongside the detention and deportation of migrants, another related huge private sector uh, of, 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 of deportation and detention, and is projected to, re to reach $742 billion by 2023. So I believe we're witnessing what I've called in another paper, the climate migration industrial complex. I know that's a big, that's a mouthful to say, uh, but I think that there is a relationship to thinking about migration now as part of a world system of, of of making money um, and, and gathering um, highly criminalized and exploited labor. So the recent rise in right-wing nationalism, xenophobia, and climate denial in the West 
is a reaction to migration and climate change. I think those two things, migration and climate change, are fueling um, uh, so much of, of an anxiety uh, on, the, on behalf of nation states and nationalists um, uh, to blame immigrants um, and to try to keep them out. So borders, and this will be one of the theses I hope I'll get to in this paper. Um, oh, crumb. Will somebody give me just a time? I thought I was going to set a clock and then I forgot to set my timer. Just tell me when I'm at 40 minutes and just, I don't know, give, give me a signal or something. Um, is that borders are sort of weapons. They're, they're being weaponized uh, to use, uh, um, to wage war against the rest of the world. I think it's definitely the opposite of what Donald Tusk said, you know, he says, oh, well, people are saying that, you know, migration is being used as a weapon uh, against Europe. Um, I think it's the other way around that borders are essentially being used as weapons, not, not immigrants. Um, okay, so the paper, which I hope to get to all three of them, but here are the theses, here are the things I want to argue. Uh, these are just condensed versions of things I've tried to argue in the books. Um, I would like to argue two correctives to two common ideas about how borders work, how we think about them. The first one is we tend to think about borders as static um, or at least geographically fixed. Uh, and the second one is that oftentimes people think that borders keep people out. Um, and so the two, two, at least two of the theses of this paper are the opposite of these assumptions. The first thesis is that borders are in motion. Um, the second is that their main function is not to stop people from moving, but to circulate them, to move and redirect them. And the third thesis, if I can get to it, is that borders are weapons uh, of primitive accumulation, what Marx calls primitive accumulation, and a climate migration industrial complex. Um, and I think that these have major implications for retheorizing borders, um, as I've, I've tried to show in my work. Uh, the consequences of all these points, the thesis I'm trying to make is that I think there's a lot of different ways to study borders, but I think at least one of them should be to think about borders more as, as patterns, um, as sort of fluid dynamic systems where you you see not necessarily blockages or simple exclusions, but kind of patterns of circulation and recirculation uh, that are sort of shifting around um, and what they're doing in the process of shifting around. And I'll give some examples of those later in the text. Um, I mean, one way to think about this too, if you're familiar with uh, uh, Michel Foucault's work, is that he has he's, he he criticizes this idea of power as being a repressive mechanism. That power is just there to oppress people, and it's this negative force. Um, and I, so this, I'm arguing a version of that idea that borders are not just about exclusion or a repression, uh, but they play this very active role. And many of the side effects of borders. Uh, at all the things that they do that don't involve actually stopping anybody are actually part of what they really are about. Um, so they're not just about trying to stop people, but they kind of multiply a whole range of effects that have to be thought of as continuous with the borders themselves, even if they don't happen at some kind of wall. Okay, so the first thesis um, is that borders are in motion. This is at first glance counterintuitive. We tend to think, I mean, if anything is solid, it's a giant concrete wall someplace. Um, but that's not all that a border is or that borders are. Uh, and in fact, the thing that makes borders so insidious and so so violent and deadly is not because they're so fixed. It's actually because they're so mobile, because they're so flexible and responsive uh, that they that they are so dangerous. Um, borders are not static. They're always made and remade according to a host of shifting variables, like somebody has to reproduce them. In this sense, the border should not be analyzed according to motion simply because people and objects move across it. So it's not just that it's uh, a permeable membrane or something and that it has to do with motion because people move across it. Well, people move across it, but people, but the border itself is also moving. Um, so a lot of the literature tends to focus on um, people moving across the borders. Um, and so there's discussion about borderscapes um, that are shaped by flows of people. So it's the people that shape the borderscape. Um, or, uh, and that's, you know, Manuel Castells talks about material form of the support of flow. So borders support the flow of people. Um, and Zygmunt Bauman describes the fluidity and mobility of them uh, just explicitly as metaphorical, like he's thinking about fluidity as a metaphor. And I want to say that it's not a metaphor. It's very much real that uh, it's not just people that move, it's borders themselves and the patterns of circulation uh, 
of instruments of, of bar barrier techniques and people moving that constitute that mobility. The whole process is highly mobile. And so it's important to think about them as, as these circulatory patterns. Um, the movement of the border is not a metaphor. The border is literally and actually in motion in several ways. Some of these sound obvious, but they have really important consequences. Um, so the border itself is in motion in the sense, I mean, in just in the sense of geomorphology, right? The movement of rivers, the shifting of sands, the tides along coastlines, weathers and seasons. So migrants trying to cross the Mediterranean uh, very much feel the mobility of those borders. Sometimes certain areas are more accessible and sometimes not. And sometimes those are due to human interventions and sometimes they're due to natural ones. Uh, hurricanes, weather patterns, unpredictable storms and so on suddenly the border can be much farther away than you thought it was or much more difficult to access. Um, the border moves uh, just in basic sense of erosion and decay uh, at the US-Mexico border is constantly happening. The border is continually being eroded uh, through weather patterns um, and just de decomposition and erosion that happen to everything. But that borders, that also happens to them and that changes what they are and what they can do um, depending on those environmental conditions. Mortar crumbles, um, patches that have been made in walls fall apart, rains and floods that rot wooden fences, fires that burn down buildings and towers, rust uh, that transforms butter, uh, borders. These are all part of the materiality of borders. Like I guess I, I wanna think about them as really mat material structures and that those material changes have material political consequences. Um, every physical border is subject to the movement of constant self decomposition. So borders are really themselves also metastable states. They're not always working. They're not always doing the same thing. They're continually breaking down, um, which has consequent consequences for migrants. For example, um, these open up spots. Um, migrants are watching for places where erosion and decay and border transformation occur, and it opens up a spot of transit. So there's ways in which the, 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 it's not just that the border is permeable or not, it's that it's sometimes permeable and sometimes not, uh, and that, that those openings are very material. They're not just ideological or, or uh, political. Um, so authorities may even leave these spots in the border uh, open or weak to force migrants into fatal situations. So for example, in the US-Mexico border, the devil, what's called the Devil's Highway, is an area in the middle of the border uh, where there is no fence, there's no wall, there's no nothing. It's just mountains and desert, uh, a very hot desert um, and very cold nights. And there's, there's, when the borders are fortified in the cities, people move and they call this the funneling effect where people are funneled towards openings where there's no border and they can cross. It's just very dangerous and many of them end up dying. So uh, that that's known, I mean, it's a known thing in the US the US government and the Border Patrol, I mean, I, I feel that they are absolutely complicit in the murder of, you know, 5,000 and num an increasing number of migrants who are trying to cross. And the same thing with the Mediterranean. We know that it's dangerous, uh, but by blocking off some borders and making the Mediterranean an, oh, the only way or certain paths through the Mediterranean an only way, they end up endangering those people. Uh, and that's, that's, I feel like that's a responsibility of states to if they built an architectural form that is shaped like a funnel that murders people, there's a responsibility there um, to, to, to change that structure. So second, um, the border is also moved by others. So it's not just naturally transformed, but other people move it. This is especially apparent in the case of territorial conflicts. So human uh, cultural economic changes transform the border. Uh, trade barriers, tariffs, labor restrictions, production zones, these also change what bo how borders work. Um, Zone-like areas, uh, for example, like settlements in the West Bank, the status of people changes depending on how uh, those the material structures of those borders are changed. So the status of a migrant as either an enemy combatant, a settler, uh, fluctuate uh, depending on what that border is shaped like and how it circulates people. Um, and maybe you all have heard of this. It was a program that started in the UK, but um, the Human Provenance Pilot Project uh, was a was a was an attempt. Uh, this way in which borders were sort of they the UK wanted to see if they could genetically test migrants who were making claims of national origin, uh, testing their their DNA to see if they had genetic origins of that region. 
Um, and they did this for like 2009, 2010, and 2011, and then it was, I believe it was discontinued in 2012, uh, just because scientists were like, that's ridiculous. You can't try to, national identity can't be traced to DNA patterns. So it was completely bunk science. Um, nonetheless, they're actually still, the UK government is still uh, entertaining the idea, but not implementing it in a structural way. But this idea that one could find the borders inside the human body uh, is another one of these ways in which borders can shift and, and, and change. Um, so thinking about borders, because they're constantly decaying, we need to think about how they're being reproduced. Um, so the border theorist Nick Von Williams writes that, quote, none of these borders in any sense is given, but reproduced through modes of affirmation and contestation, and is above all lived. In other words, borders are not natural, neutral, or static, but historically contingent, politically charged, dynamic phenomena that first and foremost involve people in their everyday lives. And those everyday lives of people passing legally, illegally, uh, whether people are allowing them to, whether the border falls apart, those are daily, those change on a daily basis. Um, and people make the border by crossing it. However, this fact uh, also makes possible the arbitrary use of police power, the profiling of migrants, micro economies of bribery, and so on. Because there's so much flexibility, uh, that flexibility can be abused by, by police, by profiling techniques. Um, even in the US, sanctuary cities, uh, so we have these sanctuary cities in the US where the federal or the local enforcement doesn't uh, help the federal immigration. Um, but even those don't fully solve the problem because if anybody, there's a there's an ICE, uh, there's an immigration and customs hotline that anybody can call and just report their neighbor or anybody else for being un undocumented and federal immigration can follow up on it. So there's a way in which where the border is, it, it happens anytime somebody can call that hotline. And that's why solidarity is such an important uh, uh, counter to, to the system of borders. Um, so we tend to think about borders, the mental images is that they're static walls um, and that I, they're more like motors. They have to be maintained and they're, they're they refueled and defended and started up and paid for and repaired. And uh, they're, they're much more like processes. Um, uh, furthermore, it's not a new phenomenon that applies only or largely to contemporary life. This is, uh, I mean, I'm giving lots of contemporary examples, but this has always been going on and I don't have the time to go into all the history, but borders have always had this, this mobility um, and this, this flexibility that I think has been sort of glossed over too quickly. Um, and the distinction between natural and artificial borders that early border theorists maintained, I just don't think we can uphold that dramatic of a difference between natural and artificial because so many natural processes are at work in every artificial border and so many artificial human processes are at work in every natural border, shaping rivers, climate change, and so on. Um, yes, and I, I wanted to, I can give one dramatic example. Uh, how, how am I doing on time? Okay, well, <laughs> um, I, I see that it's, it's, it's a... Just hold up, I have to run from my seat for that. Oh, okay. Uh, to, the, to the stage, so it, it took me a while. Um, I think you have 15, 17 minutes left. Okay, okay, great, Ex excellent. Okay, so I'm, 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 I'm on time, thank you. Sorry, everybody, for the interruption. Uh, but one really dramatic example of this natural artificial uh, distinction. So it, outside of San Diego at the US-Mexico border, um, they, there was a big ditch, like a big, uh, you know, a wetland area, a ravine where there was water. And this was seen as a security hazard because you know you can't really build a solid wall on a, wa a wetlands area. And so the solution to this was to remove uh, 2 million cubic yards of dirt, basically a mountain the size of the Empire State Building, uh, to remove that from a nearby mountain and just put it in the ditch, in the ravine. Um, and this was, you know, this was seen as a solution to the problem of insecurity, of a natural insecurity in the border was going to be artificially reconstructed, the whole landscape was going to be reconstructed. In any case, what you think will, would happen exactly happened. Anybody with any knowledge about that would quickly realize that you can't just dump dirt uh, in a giant pile to fill a wetlands 
uh, the first they built, they did that. They built a bunch of wall infrastructure. And then the first time it rained, it was like the whole thing just eroded. The wall fell apart, crumbled into the valley and produced a very large border insecurity. Um, in any case, that 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 process and there's other examples we could use from Palestine um, attempts to build walls in insecure natural environments, but the natural environment is responding to those walls and nature doesn't want to let that stay there. Um, and so it's constantly being eroded and decaying. Um, and so nature is its own kind of border crossing. Um, okay, so just as all of these shifts and change ha changes happen to borders, as those changes happen, they mark out new migrant positions, new uh, identities for migrants and new openings for them. Uh, you know, even possibly overnight in the case of the Russian military, sort of secretly in the middle of the night, moving border markers uh, over into the border of Georgia. And, you know, you could imagine sort of going to sleep in Georgia and waking up in Russia being an undocumented migrant because the border had moved while you slept. Uh, that's a very dramatic example, but um, just trying to give, a, give some of these. Another one would be after Trump, uh, 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 issued the travel ban while people were in mid-flight from, you know, various countries, just in mid-air, the border can change. And then when you arrive, um, like people arrived in Denver and elsewhere, uh, they just went straight to detention centers um, after arriving um, the moment that that bill was was passed. So where where is the border? Uh, when does it, when is the border? When does it happen? It can happen in flight. Okay, so um, the second thesis I want to argue, and then maybe this is a more positive, constructive one is that if borders aren't stopping people uh, and they're moving, they are producing a circulation. Um, there, So that's the second thesis is that borders are processes of circulation. I don't think it's very helpful to understand borders in terms of just inclusion and exclusion. So there's, you know, a lot of work on Agamben talks about borders in this way of inclusion and exclusion. And I just, I think there's a limit to thinking about them in that way. Uh, and I think it's more helpful to think about them as processes of material circulation. Uh, in part, this follows from the mobility of the border, since the border is always in between and in motion, it's continually changing. It's a continually changing process. They're never done ever fully including someone or excluding someone. Anybody who is included can at any bit moment be excluded. And just to say that difference is not very helpful. We want to know more how. Where are they moved? What happens to them? What is the detention and deportation process like? So this is not the case only because empirically borders are at the outskirts of society and within them, uh, uh, and it regularly changes their selection process, as we said before, but also because exclusion is not synonymous with stasis. The exclusion is always mobilized or circulated. So if we want to talk about exclusion, I think we should think about exclusion as a regime of, of motion, uh, some process of exclusion, where you're never done being fully excluded, but you're always held on to in that process. I mean, if you think about the deportation and detention systems that are you know, uh, largely privatized in the US, they're making tons of money by maintaining those people. So in practice, borders, both internal and external, have never successfully uh, kept everyone out. Borders have never worked like that. Um, they constantly let people through um, uh, and they're not these kinds of binary categories of inclusion and exclusion. The failure of borders to include or exclude is not just contemporary waning of sovereignty of post-national states. They've always leaked. The so-called greatest examples of historical wall power, Hadrian's Wall, the Great Wall of China, were not meant to keep people out absolutely. Um, the walls, that's just not how they worked. Uh, we can romanticize them, but in practice, they did all kinds of things. They were about social circulation and modulating that, forms of labor and taxes. Uh, they were about taxation. Um, and that continues today. In the case of the US-Mexico border wall, the success rate of illegally crossing the wall is around 90%, according to several studies. Most of the traffic across the border is related to economic regulation. Um, that's how that it, mostly people get through there and they're taxed or tariffed or you know goods are regulated and so on and people who want to cross uh can uh and the consequences are dangerous and so on but people do and can cross quite easily so one of the main effects is not keeping people out but circulating people in a particular pattern um and that process of criminalizing them killing them extracting taxes from them and so on 
those are all part of a process. Um, so just, you know, uh, uh, we talked about the cage effect of the border that, or sorry, of the funnel effect, people are funneled in, but once they are funneled in, it's very much like, you know, one of those traps where a bee flies in or a fly flies in to get some honey or something, but then it's shaped like a funnel they can't get out again, uh, which is a real effect. And the government's well aware that the border actually keeps people in because they don't want to leave. Once they've arrived, they worry that if they leave, they won't be able to get back in again. And so they stay and they overstay their visas. And so the border doesn't just work like keeping people out. It funnels them in and then cages them in. It's more like a trap uh, in that way. Um, and one of the things uh, that it does quite well is to recirculate and there's tons of money to be made. So to allow and fully know that migrants are coming through um, and then allow, and then having the border be a, 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 a activity of criminalization, then criminalizes the people, even if it didn't stop them, that wasn't the point. The point was to change their status from being legal to illegal migration, and then to, then to arrest those people, and then to detain them for as long as possible in detention centers that are subsidized by the government. And so that those companies make tons and tons of money, billions, billions of dollars, and then those companies lobby the politicians to have increasingly strict immigration uh, laws and to criminalize them and prosecute them as criminal. So they end up going through a criminal system and then being detained and then sometimes being put in prisons uh, in addition to detention centers without having ever committed any certainly violent crime, but sometimes no crime whatsoever. They have just overstayed their visa or found to have not had papers. Um, and then the deportation system uh, made of private companies of buses and airplanes uh, then once they're finally released, funnels them back out just to the other side of the border where they will, without any other options, come back to the United States, back through the system again. And there's more like a loop of extraction where every time they go through, there's private companies that are profiting um, through the criminalization. So it's not so much that the border is stopping them as it is sort of caging them, uh, funneling them and extracting things from them. So another border, border theorist, David Newman writes, uh, this is a great quote, it's not the, uh, it's the process of bordering rather than the borderline per se that has universal significance in the ordering of society, end quote. So the border is the social technique of reproducing the limit points after which that which returns can return again under different conditions. So now you're a criminal, now you're a worker, now you're a commuter, and the shifting of those statuses is part of what the border does. So it doesn't decide, like Agamben says, like it's not some sovereign exception or decision on who is excluded. Uh, it's not a question of inclusion or exclusion fully, radically. It's more of a process. Um, it redistributes. Um, undocumented migrants, for example, are for the most part not blocked out, as I said, 90% acceptance or a, a crossing rate, but rather redistributed as functionally criminalized people uh, where they can be hyper exploited in underground economies or an economic surplus that is extracted from their incarcerated bodies as they pass through the private detention industrial complex. I mean, they get, it's those, these private centers get like $200 per bed per night by, from the government to just hold these people. Um, and which are why they're just awaiting to hear from a judge. And the longer that process takes, the longer they stay in those places and those companies make money. So they're released on the other side of the border just to complete the process again. Uh, one other European example is uh, the French border uh, patrol cutting the soles out of the shoes of migrants coming moving through Italy. So once the migrants move through Italy, they arrive at the border and the French authorities uh, don't necessarily, you know, detain them. It's not the same system, but will cut the soles out of their shoes, give the shoes back and then deport them back to the south of Italy. Um, and then what happens is that you know, the migrants then begin again, uh, but there's this transformation. They know they're not stopping these migrants. They have nowhere else to go. They're circulating them. But through the circulation, there is, in the case of the French authorities, a kind of an a, a abuse, uh, a cutting of the souls and a degradation each time uh, of the people. So it's not at all this, you know, Carl Schmittian sovereign decision. It is much more like a structure of circulation. Um, Okay, I, I, I'm probably getting close to my time here, but let me just summarize here. Uh, the, the conclusion here is that I think borders are much more mobile than we, than we typically think, uh, that they don't function to stop 
as much as they do to kind of circulate in certain ways. Um, I do have one other thesis about climate change and migration, but um, do I have enough time to say anything ab about that? I think if it's a quick, a quick um, thing, it would be possible. I mean, you have five more minutes or let's say four more minutes. Oh, five more minutes. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, well then I will say five more minutes and then you just like turn the camera or something when I'm, when I'm out of time here. But um, yeah, the third thesis that is that climate change uh, and borders are being used as weapons of primitive accumulation. And this sounds weird because we think about climate change as this natural disaster, but it's an extremely politicized disaster. And I will give just only a very brief outline of, of the steps. Step one, uh, would be the history of colonialism has essentially extracted so much from colonized countries uh, that there is a history. I mean, most recently, the history of globalization and uh, neoliberal development has essentially produced uh, a large movement of people from uh, develop, developing countries to uh, developed Western countries. So that that displacement, that's not an accident, that is a part of the colonial process, is the displacement of those people by taking those resources um, and underdeveloping those countries. So it produces this global flow of people. And what do borders do? Borders work like weapons of colonization because they happen uh, and then they, they the, 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 the globally dispossessed have to pass through these borders. Um, and largely they pass through either undocumented or they'll get visas and then overstay those visas because they don't have other options um, and they will become criminalized and they will become de-statused and depoliticized. And then next that population becomes a kind of, you know, what, what Marx calls the, uh, the industrial reserve labor army, but we could say a kind of migrant, uh, climate migrant industrial post-colonial reserve labor army. That's way too wordy to say, but uh, you get the idea that there is this population that is now ready to be hyper exploited, not just paid a wage and exploited, but hyper exploited as a non-status, non-political, non-organizable group of people that is the result of colonization and of criminalization at the border, then hyper exploitation, and then use that labor itself as a means to further the development of global capitalism, which further increases the colonization. You get the idea and repeat, but that's a global system and borders play a role in that process of criminalization, but they're not stopping people so much as they are changing the status, criminalizing them, uh, and then circulating that and reproducing the cycles in ever expanding you know, limits, as Marx says, of a spiral kind of going over ever outward of capital accumulation uh, and, and global domination and climate displacement. Okay, that was a lot, it's a mouthful. There's more to say, but I only had five minutes. So anyway, thanks, thank you all for, for listening and yes.